I'm Larry McCullough, and welcome to the Hall Institute of Public Policy series on the American Voter 2012. Um, the American National Election Studies is a research project of the University of Michigan and Stanford University, and it has this to say about voting. At its core, voting is a psychological act. It is the behavior of one citizen using the information and experiences he or she has gathered over a period of years to make a consequential selection among offered options. Well, today we're going to talk about who votes, who doesn't, and why. And we have with us our guest, uh, Ms. Ingrid Reed, who is a policy analyst and the former director of the New Jersey Project at Eagleton Institute of Politics, Rutgers University. She has published widely on voting participation and has conducted studies on voting for the Century Foundation, Pew Charitable Trusts, the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. She has served on the New Jersey State Planning Committee for implementing the Federal Help America Vote Act and was the assistant dean of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of International, uh, Public and International Affairs. Ms. Reed, um, according to the United States Election Project, mm -hmm. in 2008, 61.8% of eligible voters actually voted in the presidential election. But that also means 38.4%, over a third uh, of eligible voters didn't, didn't vote. Can you give us an overview of the current voting patterns? Um, what, are there certain groups of people that consistently vote, certain groups of people that don't vote, and maybe the reasons why? Um, I'd be glad to. It seems as though people who are settled in a place and have become accustomed to what it takes to vote are probably the most consistent voters. That means people who are older, uh, people who are better educated and tend to um, try to be informed, but it also means people who have a preference for one party or the other and see voting as a way of remaining faithful to that party. So there are a number of reasons why people vote and don't vote, but I think we even need to step back a bit and say, uh, you cannot vote unless you are registered. And uh, so you really have to ask the question first, what, who registers to vote? And if, if they don't, what are the reasons? Um, and if there are good reasons, uh, what can we do about them? And I would say that if you ask people who haven't registered to vote, um, or if you ask people why you do or do not vote, that half of it would fall into the way you see yourself. It goes back to the, your quote about, uh, it's a very personal psychological thing. And that is, does my vote matter? Does it uh, make a difference? Uh, should I bother uh, to vote? Do I know enough about who I should vote for that it really does make a difference? So you can put sort of half of the reasons in that category. But interestingly enough, there's another category, and that is that um, I don't know where to register, I don't know where to vote, or uh, I never know what day it is. And we think of the national election when everybody's been talking about voting, um, that people, how can people forget to go and vote on a Tuesday? But it's also not convenient. So there are a whole host of societal reasons that keep people um, from, uh, from voting, uh, not just your own personal uh, inclination. Um, and I, I might say that we're a mobile society, and moving is one of the big reasons. Psychologically, that people don't vote because they don't know what town they're living in or who's running and so on, but they also don't re-register. We don't give people a voting card that's good anywhere. I mean, it even gets down to your own town and your own county. If we're talking about New Jersey, if you move it uh, within your own county, if you know enough to ask for a provisional ballot, blah, 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 all that, you can vote. But basically, being mobile is, uh, is tough on, on voting. And, well, I'll stop there because I'd like to say a little bit more about that when we talk about this year's election. Okay. Well, speaking of this year's election or, or maybe some of the past ones here in New Jersey, when you have over one-third of the eligible voters not voting mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, what impact does that really have on, on, on the campaign? Well, and, and the well, obviously, you are, first of all, from a society point of view, you're, you're missing um, a lot of people's opinions who are living here and paying taxes. I'd like to know more about the New Jersey voter because we have about a million four, eight million four people in New Jersey. And we currently have um, more than five million registered voters. 
So if you assume that of the three million people who are not registered to vote, a good number of those are too young or not citizens. Uh, so much of our politics, like districts that are formed, are based on population, not on voters. So to some extent, I think New Jersey is doing a little bit better because you'd have to say that maybe close to three quarters of uh, eligible uh, voters are, are registered, if you take that sort of very sketchy mathematical. Uh, but we're, we don't have a very good record of people voting in elections other than the presidential election. We did very well in 2008, where we saw more than 70% of registered voters voting in that election. I think it's sort of generally assumed that that election energized voters, that people really cared and wanted to go out. In addition to the campaigns, having new sophisticated get out the vote uh, efforts. So the two things sort of went together. But we're terrible when it comes to voting in school board elections. And they probably are a good example of, I don't know who's running, I don't know where to go to vote, I don't know what hours they are, you know, that kind of thing. And, and also our, our legislative elections, which are held in, if you think of it nationally, in off years. New Jersey goes to the polls every year. And so when we vote for the legislature, nobody else is voting. So you don't hear a lot about it on television. So at that point, we really have a very low voter turnout, 30% if, if we're lucky. But that also correlates with people who say they are affiliated with one party or the other. So what we have are party faithfuls turning out. And, uh, but I think as we look at this 2012 election, we probably should question whether or not there's the same kind of energy and involvement that people had. Does the economy sort of depress people in the sense of it doesn't make any difference? Um, but I would say that we probably could anticipate uh, closer to the kind of turnout that we had in 2008 than the kind of dismal turnout that we have in other elections in New Jersey. And it's funny because those legislative elections, they're the people that make our laws. Exactly. That really do affect the, 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 the Well, even lives. in our gubernatorial election yeah. the last time, we just barely, if made, I mean, it was like 49%. So only about half of the people turned out for that. And those school board elections, um, I had a neighbor where I grew up in Indianapolis uh, who was uh, just an average business person and he became on the school board. And then he ran on, got elected to city council, then he became mayor and eventually became United States Senator Richard Luger. And it all came from just an ordinary person. Right. You know, so here's a person in, in, in the U.S. Senate just right. So it doesn't matter who you vote for. for well, I guess uh, you brought up other countries. We probably in this country should think more creatively about when you can vote. I mean, let's face it, Tuesday is a work day and the kinds of work days that people now, I mean, uh, um, I guess it related to the agrarian culture, but uh, I, I don't even quite buy that. But I mean, if you think of, of the, that people start their days very early because they're driving an hour to get to their jobs. So even if the polls open at six o'clock, it's hard for people who are working to get there. And they're open until nine, but lots of people, um, uh, you know, in New Jersey, I guess it's eight. Mm -hmm. Now, don't, please, people listening, don't check what time, <laughs> or maybe we can put it up on the screen so people know. Um, but uh, people's work days go long as well. And, and on a Tuesday, uh, just think how different the world would be if you could pick, uh, if you wanted to vote on a Saturday or Sunday, there, you would be respecting all religious um, uh, days and you would give people flexibility. If you could turn up in your libraries or in your town hall rather than remembering where you go um, to vote, but we, we don't make it easy for, uh, for people to vote. But there's another school of thought that says this is voting is serious. If you really want to vote, you'll figure out how to get there and to do it. But I think that's not the way our culture works today. Yeah. Now, we've heard a lot about the uh, new voter ID laws mm -hmm. passed in, in many states. Mm -hmm. um, and some people fear that it's going to actually discourage people from voting because, mm -hmm. number one, they won't know what kind of ID they need or right. are they registered. Um, can you talk about that? I know the Brennan Center for Justice is really concerned. There's all kinds of public service right. announcements trying to get people uh, mm -hmm. the straight answers. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, what's this going to be? 
Um, I, I think that we've already seen in other states that have adopted uh, the, the, the voter ID requirement that it does make it difficult uh, for people, especially people who have been registered for a long time and are used to going to their polling place and can't understand why they now have to uh, scramble around to get uh, a, a photograph that um, is acceptable um, and, uh, and go through the hoops of, in effect, re-registering. Um, and so that tends to be people who are older, uh, people who have not had jobs that require um, voter ID or have not gone to college where you have a voter ID. So it's uh, estimated and in some cases proved that it really does eliminate um, uh, people who um, are, I would say, poorer and, um, and less educated uh, because they just simply are not in that stream of having a, uh, a driver's license. The other thing that it does, unless we change how people register, it means that the way a lot of people get registered is through the uh, energy of parties or League of Women Voters sitting at the supermarket. Yep. And, uh, and people come to count on that as a place. If you've moved, I'll bet half of the people think they'll encounter somebody at the supermarket where they can re-register. Yep. But these new rules make it very difficult uh, for volunteers to do that. And there are also new rules about who can be that kind of voter volunteer and how you turn in those voter um, registrations. So um, uh, I think that, um, and we certainly haven't proven that voter ID is really the crux to um, making sure that we have confidence in our elections. Uh, the, the effort to encourage people to vote by mail appears to be a way that much more voter fraud is taking mm -hmm. place. <laughs> And that's not addressed at all yeah. in the voter yeah. I, I, in in voting uh, yeah. voting by mail. I well, know a lot of the the, the, the parties uh, they like to get those early votes in by mail because it's, mm -hmm. the people sure. are locked in. Yeah. They won't be swayed by last minute advertisement right. or a snowstorm. Right. On, 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 but on it that also day. is convenient. I think yeah. we've seen yeah. people um, actually saying, "Look, if I can't be sure I'm going to get to the." polling place on a Tuesday, I want to vote. And in New Jersey, we used to have to say, I'm sick or I'm out of the country mm -hmm, yeah. and so on. But now it's really a mail ballot. And I think that that does help uh, in terms of participation. What do other democracies do uh, to, to motivate people to vote? I mean, some of these countries like Australia, that the voting rate is 95%, Cambodia, 90%. I mean, people are taking it very seriously there. Right. As well, said uh, I think that one of the interesting things is in some countries like Cambodia, where people have not been able to vote, they really appreciate uh, what it means to have a say. And so you see very high participation in countries where you haven't had um, uh, the, the privilege of voting. But I think in, in other countries, they, um, uh, first of all, vote on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Um, also, the, the public information is much more structured in those countries than it is here. Um, for example, on our own public television station, uh, I watch it faithfully, there was no effort made to inform voters about when to register to vote, um, uh, um, letting people know in the primary when you could change your party so that you've, yeah. if you decided to vote. Um, no real campaign at, um, at voter uh, information. That's interesting. And, and reminding people. The other thing that we don't do very well is, and you'd think we would with television, is sort of demonstrate uh, what it is to go to vote. Yeah. Uh, young people tell us that they're really intimidated by going into a polling place. They don't know what, what to do and who are these people sitting at these tables and what do they want and so on. <laughs> so that as much as we dramatize yeah. and we think of our ads, you know, yeah. drinking beer, how do you do that? You yeah. pour it in the bottle and you sit there and you, you know, tap on the glass. We don't do any of that with, with voting. Wow, so funny. I think we really need to rethink that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and, and it's, it's certainly from the surveys, it's yeah. the case. People are sort of confused. It's too hard. Well, what does it mean that it's too hard? It means that I don't feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. So uh, we could be more imaginative and, and more systematic. Yeah. What are some of the other uh, studies that you've done that, that have shown that uh, here in New Jersey, certain people tend to not vote or, uh, or they have reasons or, or 
you know, are there particular groups that, I guess if I'm a political um, strategist, there's some people I can safely ignore. Right. Are there people that you just say, not even gonna bother with right. them? Well, I think um, I have been struck by the fact that people say it doesn't make any difference uh, to vote. And quite frankly, in New Jersey and in most places, certainly we know that there's very little turnover in Congress, uh, uh, so that people are in districts where it's pretty certain that the incumbent will be reelected. And I happen to think that, uh, that voters catch on to that. And in New Jersey, uh, you could make a very good calculation of whether it's worth your while to go and vote depending on what the character of your district is. And if Republicans constantly get elected in your district and no change, you, you hear that there have been no changes made, you know, it doesn't make any difference if you go to vote if you're a Democrat. It does, your vote's not going to really count for anything. And I think that really is um, uh, um, and sort of an underlying uh, why should I pay attention. Um, and it then motivates people who are very closely uh, tied to a party to say, I want to make sure my party looks good at the polls. I'm going to show up. And there's a, uh, a network of people saying, you better go and vote. Um, so I think that the lack of contests is, is an issue. But then there also is the character of campaigns. And those people who are not strongly affiliated with a party get um, tend to say, I don't want to have anything to do with this, when attack ads become the only kind of political uh, information that they get. I don't want to be a part of that. And um, I don't know if your viewers are interested in Googling. I have two names that are hard to spell, but you might remember them. Aunt Solo Beer is an easy one to find. And Yengar are two political scientists from Stanford who said they really wanted to find out what nasty ads mean to voters. So they put together a cohort of viewers that they invited to watch a news program. And they had an equal number of Republicans, Democrats, people, and, and people who said they were unaffiliated. They could vote either way. And they set up this newscast that, into which they injected um, uh, ads, as, as we would see in a newscast. And so it wasn't about the newscast, it was about yeah. the ads. And then they asked people to rate the ads. And it turned out that the political affil people affiliated and said they're strongly Republican or Democrat were cheering for the attack ad <laughs> where their party was beating up the other person, yeah. while the people who weren't affiliated said they really hated those ads mm. or that they would turn them off. Mm. And I think that we see that in, uh, in our society. I guess one of the, the, you asked me about different parts of our society. As people are looking to this 2012 election, they've estimated that a third of the young people, 18 to 29, and probably an equal amount, maybe 40% of unmarried white women who participated at a higher rate in the last presidential election have moved. Hmm. And so therefore, unless they're somehow captured yeah. in registration, wow. re-registration races, even if you engage them hmm. in the campaign, they might not be able to vote. Hmm. So it's not an easy situation hmm. in terms of of uh, guessing who can vote because not everybody can. Yeah. And then there's the other part of it that, that you started out with sort of the psychology yeah. of do we feel that we want to be in it in this participation and can we figure out how to do it and feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. Is there a particular book that you might recommend that uh, on, on American voting gives sort of an overview of, of again the psychology of um, yeah, I guess that the one that I turn to is a book that was done by Michael Della Carpini, who is now the dean of um, the uh, Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, where Kathleen Jameson, uh, also very well known for analyzing ads and so on, uh, did about voters. It maybe is six or seven years old, but I think it's still a very good book uh, that's sympathetic to the challenge of being a voter. Um, you know, it doesn't beat people over the head and say you ought to do it or, uh, or say that it doesn't matter, yeah. which is sort of the yeah. two <laughs> poles. And, um, and I think it's a very informative uh, um, book. I don't know who published it, but with, this, with the Google yeah. mechanism today, I think anybody could find Can it. Can you say the uh, title and author again? 
Uh, the, the book is something like The American Voter, okay. and it's Michael Della, D-E-L-L-A, Carpini, okay. C-A-R-P-I-N-I, and he's the dean of the Annenberg School okay. at the University of Pennsylvania. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, just to wrap up, what do you believe is the most effective means of convincing someone to vote for a certain candidate? What do you think really works in, in getting someone to you know, push a particular button? I really believe it's your family and friends. Mm -hmm. And if you are in a environment, in a town, if you trust people who tell you what's going on in the election, when all is said and done, I think that it is a really, uh, very much of a social um, value uh, set. And um, uh, you have to really feel like you belong and, 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 and that you can care and that's respected. I, when all is said and done, I really believe that uh, it's something that people do because they're part of a society and they care. Well, well great. Well, thanks a lot for being okay. with us, Ms. Ingrid Reed, and we will see you again on the American Voter Series. Thank you.